So there were three lines of research that were that kind of came together in what has been um, called the golden spike by analogy of the railroads coming from the east and the west coast and meeting somewhere in the middle of the country with the golden spike. In yeast, work was going on, started again in the, in the early 70s, um, identifying genes that were required for the cell division cycle, and there was one of them called CDC28, or CDC2, and another um, species of yeast, which was known to be absolutely essential for, um, for, my, for mitosis, the last stage of the cell division cycle. And in frog embryos, the, the um, other sort of great organism contributing to this research, work um, starting in the 70s from uh, a Japanese-Canadian researcher named Yoshi Mizui had discovered, and then now this gets a little bit technical, so anybody who's listening to this can kind of go out and you know have a cup of coffee and come back in five minutes. Um, um, I have to explain about the cell division cycle. There are um, four stages. One is an early stage called G1, and then you go into S for DNA synthesis, and then there's another gap stage called G2, and then you go into mitosis, um, or in, in uh, the meiotic stage we call um, meiosis one or two. And in frog eggs, uh, it was a particularly wonderful material because oocytes, um, as in all organisms, you and me and frogs and clams and sea urchins, the oocyte is arrested in that second gap stage. It's finished making its DNA, but it hasn't gone into the last stage, M phase, before um, cell division. And so it's called a, G a G2 arrested oocyte. And once the frog eggs are, oocytes are stimulated by hormone to go through their first meiotic division and second meiotic division, then they arrest a second time uh, in metaphase, called metaphase two, and they'll stay that way until the sperm comes along and breaks that metaphase arrest. So what Mizui did was he took with a needle, frog eggs are very big, they're more than a millimeter across, he could suck out cytoplasm from an M phase arrested egg and micro inject it into a G2 arrested oocyte. And what he saw was that injection of that cytoplasm would induce the G2 arrested oocyte to re-enter the, the meiotic cell cycle and go into M phase. So there was some activity in the M phase arrested egg. Part of the golden spike actually happened here at the MBL when Tim Hunt in, uh, I guess it was 82 or 83, when he, when he discovered that this proteins A and B oscillated in anthem cyclins, he was living in the dorm also. And he was having lunch with one of the visitors to the embryology course, John Gerhardt from San Francisco. And Gerhardt and Mark Kirshner, from, also from San Francisco, had been working on this factor that could drive, uh, that you could take out of M phase arrested eggs and inject into um, G2 arrested oocytes and, and drive them into the cell cycle. And they, uh, that, that activity had been called meiosis or M phase promoting factor. And their lab and other labs had seen that M phase promoting factor oscillated across the cell cycle, going up during most of the cell cycle and then disappearing at the end of mitosis or um, meiosis. And so he told, Tim Hunt told John Gerhardt about, about this cyclin oscillating behavior and Gerhardt said, do you know about MPF? And Hunt said, no. <laughs> and Gerhardt said, well, let me tell you about this. So, you know, within probably a week of Tim Hunt's original observation um, in the physiology course, we're, uh, we're working actually with sea urchin eggs, that there was an oscillatory behavior um, called cyclins uh, that looked like the protein that we had um, identified in the clam. Um, all of a sudden, there was, a, an a, there was an indication that cyclins might be actually involved or an activator of MPF, or a component of MPF, or something regulated by MPF. So that, that was like going from looking at a dish of stuff to you know, 100x magnification on an amazing microscope. It was just like that. And you know, the field just took off after that. Then um, Tim Hunt and I, 
uh, met here at the MBL for several subsequent summers to work together on clam oocytes and just to uh, and and the cyclins to try to understand the, the cycling behavior during all sorts of perturbations to the cell cycle. And in parallel, my lab um, had um, developed an antibody to cyclin A, and we knew that if you co-precipitate cyclin with other proteins, it has an activity, an enzymatic activity. That immunoprecipitate can phosphorylate proteins. Um, so it has a kinase, then an enzyme that can do that is called a kinase, and it can transfer phosphate onto various acceptor proteins. And we had seen that it could phosphorylate it, a particular test protein called histone H1. So I was visiting, um, I was giving a seminar out in California, one of those S institutions, Scripps or the Salk, where I was visiting Steve Reed and I told him about this. He had been working on CDC2 and CDC28 in yeast, and he said, oh, CDC2 immune, and CDC28 immunoprecipitates can phosphorylate histone H1. So all of a sudden, again, just from talking to colleagues, and it's just, it's a wonderful, um, you know, it's just a wonderful lesson everybody should really get, that you should tell people about your results, um, all these odd things, because uh, rather than waiting for publications, because it makes tremendous amount of progress. And it's, good, it's, it's, you know, one of the reasons that we have conferences gets people together to talk about things before publication. So immediately, I thought that, whoa, um, CD, maybe cyclin A or B, was associated with this cell cycle regulatory protein CDC2, which had been identified in yeast. And so we set about to test that idea. Um, and if the overarching idea here was that a complex of cyclin and CDC2 might actually be the elusive MPF. And in order to test whether cyclin actually had MPF activity, since we had the cloned messenger RNAs, we could make um, the protein. Um, and so we could test whether that protein could actually induce phragocytes in the classic MPF assay to go into um, M phase. So what we did was, rather than injecting the protein, we just injected the messenger RNA into the phragocyte, which obligingly translated us into the, pro into the protein. And then, lo and behold, it broke the cell cycle arrest, and the oocytes went into M phase, and they went through the two meiotic divisions and arrested it metaphase two, just like MPF would do. So um, all of those things came together. Um, in 1989, tremendous um, breakthrough. So in many different fronts from, from sort of the core organisms, um, yeast, frog, clam, and sea urchin. And then once the yeast folks thought that, um, knew that their CDC2 or CDC28 was, might be associated with the cyclin, they went looking for it and they found it. So um, all of a sudden, within the space of maybe four years, there was sort of a universal theory of a, M, uh, M, a theory of universal M phase regulator.